Hello and welcome to Freed Indeed Live. I'm your host, Kevin J. N. Hughes, and I am joined today by my buddy, my favorite co-host, and my co-author, Caleb J. Mullins. We are here to discuss um, our book again. This is the second part in our series discussing different aspects of the awesome book that we're about to publish. We're getting ready to publish right now. Um, and today we wanna to talk about a mysterious figure from the Bible who longtime listeners will know about, um, and that's Azazel. So Caleb, why don't you introduce our discussion today? Yeah, uh, so Azazel, as you mentioned, a very mysterious figure who only really gets mentioned twice in the same book of the Bible in Leviticus, but at the same time, a figure that has a deep-seated tradition in Judaism right? Um, as well. And we're talking, when I say Judaism, I don't mean modern Judaism. I mean, right. yeah, I Second guess what we more Second Temple Judaism, Yahwism, uh, the original religion of the ancient hebrews and uh, of course our books touch on myth and and legend mm -hmm. and and all that kind of stuff and so this character plays a part in our story uh and i i think the other problem with this guy is that people read about or, or if they even read about azazel um it, you know they don't even know who this is right and, it's because they they haven't really delved into the broader tradition which produced the scriptures uh, nor into the literature commentaries on the old testament that would have existed in christ's own time period and before christ's uh, own time period in his earthly ministry and unfortunately they miss out on a great deal of significance and importance uh, as far as who this figure is and how he fit, fits into not only the torah but also into the history of salvation and later Christian traditions as well. Uh, so that's kind of exactly. the, the, the jumping off point for Azazel, but uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, for sure. And so um, you made reference to Leviticus, Leviticus 16. Um, yeah. I don't, I don't really want to read all of Leviticus 16. Today. No, we don't have to. Yeah. yeah. But um, kind of just to give people an idea, ver starting in verse 6, it says, Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering for himself and shall make atonement for himself and for his house. So this is the day of atonement ritual. Aaron has to mm -hmm. start by making atonement for himself, cleansing himself so that he is prepared for the ritual itself. And then he shall take two goats and set them before the Lord at the entrance to the tent of meeting. And Aaron shall cast lots over the two goats, one for the Lord and the other lot for Azazel. So one of these goats mm. is going to God. One of the goats is going to Azazel or Azazel, however you want to pronounce it. I don't care. Um, <laughs> and Aaron shall present the goat on which the lot fell to the Lord as a sin offering but the goat on which the lot fell for Azazel shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement over it. So notice right away, by the way, the sin offering and the atonement, two separate things. Um, yep. that, that's something because a lot of times in discussions about the atonement, people conflate this. No, two separate categories. One of the goats is the goat that's offered to the Lord as a sin offering. The other goat is the one that's for atonement and is given to Azazel. Mm -hmm. um, that it may be sent away into the wilderness to Azazel. So um, basically, like I said, I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but basically the way that this ritual works is you have two goats and they're the goat goats they're the greatest goats of all time and <laughs> you you take them and they have to be totally without blemish or anything then you cast lots over them and 50 50 you know um one of them is going to be the goat for the lord and that goat has 
uh, it becomes the sin offering. But the other goat, so by the way, the sin offering does not, Aaron does not place his hands over the sin offering. That is something that people say happened, but I challenge you to read this chapter and find where Aaron lays his hands on the sin offering. It doesn't happen. The yeah, the transference Aaron, of sin doesn't happen. Yeah. Exactly. The goat that Aaron places his hands on and puts the sins of Israel on is the goat for Azazel, not the goat for the Lord, which if you stop and think about it makes sense because in all of the other places in scripture where people are making sacrifices, mm -hmm. if a sacrifice is unclean, then God doesn't accept it. The, the same reason God right. wouldn't accept, uh, God wouldn't yeah. let you sacrifice a pig or a squid to him. It's the same <laughs> reason why... I'm he... getting a mental picture. That's amazing. <laughs> God wouldn't let you sacrifice Cthulhu to him. <laughs> or a well, human for that right, matter or a human yeah or a human so um god doesn't allow that but therefore if you did confess the sins of israel if you did put the sins of israel onto a goat it would no longer be fit to be a sacrifice to yahweh but the other right. goat the one that does have the sins of israel put on him is sent out into the wilderness for azazel and um, I want to clarify something really quick because I know people are going to, um, people who are new to this are going to wonder about this. And I've gotten this question a number of times before, so I'll just head it off at the pass. No, the goat for Azazel is not being sacrificed to a false god, which is why the yep. scripture is very clear that they weren't supposed to kill it. Um, I know that later traditions, um, out extra biblical traditions, talk about them like beating up and stoning and throwing off a cliff the goat for Azazel but biblically they weren't supposed to do that because you're not supposed to kill the goat for Azazel because right. it's, because if you kill the goat for Azazel you're sacrificing to a demon um but the reason mm -hmm. why they send the sins into the wilderness to the demon is because we have to understand this from the perspective of um, sacred geography and from the perspective of the ancient Hebrew cos cosmology. So the way that the ancient Hebrews see the wilderness is they see the wilderness as the place of death. And Azazel, therefore, is this demon who rules over death. So the way that the Hebrews see Azazel is as this figure who um, I'll let Caleb get into this a little bit more because he knows more about the history of this than I do, I think. But the first time we meet Azazel, he's not actually named. The first time we meet Azazel is in Genesis chapter 6. Um, I think it's Genesis 6. No, sorry. Uh, Genesis 6 is the flood. We meet Azazel um, in Genesis chapter 4, I think it is. Um where Cain, it, God says to Cain that sin is crouching at your door. That word crouching mm. is actually not a Hebrew word. A lot of people don't know this, but in the Hebrew Kadian. Bible, exactly. It's actually yeah. a Hebrew transliteration of an Akkadian word. And the reason why that's significant is because the specific word that's used is the word used in Akkadian mythology for a specific kind of demon that comes up from the underworld and that is seen as the one who brings temptation. And the way the Akkadians pictured this demon was that it was like a shadow monster with a goat head that would crouch in your bedroom and try to the like croucher. whisper. Yeah. Exactly. It would try to whisper things to you to do evil. And so that's actually the same figure that is Azazel. Azazel is the name of this crouching demon. And the Jews understood this, which is why they would essentially put the sins of Israel, put the sins of the people onto this goat, which Azazel has a goat head. That's how he appears to people. So it goes on the goat. And then you send the goat out into the wilderness 
because you're giving the sins that that Azazel has tricked us into committing you're giving those sins back to him <clears throat> you're saying i don't want these sins anymore i reject them and i'm giving them back to the one who brought them to me in the first place and so yeah. basically you're giving azazel his own sins back and in the new testament the reason why this becomes so significant is because when jesus dies he dies outside of Jerusalem in the wilderness. So he is actually engaged in combat against Azazel. And he is the fulfillment of both of the goats <clears throat> because he offers himself up to God as the perfect sin offering. But he also offers <clears throat> himself in combat against Azazel and thus defeats Azazel, which is why the psalmist says that he casts our sin as far as the east is to the west. He's casting our sin into the wilderness and throwing it back on Azazel and saying, my people are not under the curse of Azazel anymore because I've taken mm -hmm. their sins into the wilderness on their behalf. And so that's what the Day of Atonement is actually prefiguring. It's prefiguring that twofold work of Christ, that on the one hand, he offers humanity in the person of himself up to God, but on the other hand, he goes out bearing our sins into the wilderness and does mm -hmm. battle with the demons that have brought that sin upon us. So that's what Jesus is doing. Um, but in order to understand that that's what Jesus is doing, We've done whole videos on that subject, by the way, so check out our other videos on the Day of Atonement and on atonement in order to understand this. But um, really, we're getting at the heart of it. I think this might be the first time where we've really gone in depth on the history of Azazel, which mm -hmm. is an important component of understanding the Day of Atonement and an important component of understanding everything i just said about our yeah. view of how jesus defeats the demons so caleb can you give us a little bit more of that history on um azazel and what azazel is all about yeah and so everything you said is correct and so azazel's you. name <laughs> yeah so uh, and I'm going to point out here that a lot of people may be reading, you know, grabbing their Bible and flipping through Leviticus 17 or pulling out their Strong's Concordance or whatever and say, I'm not finding a Azazel here. I'm not finding that name right. anywhere. I'm not surprised if that's the case because a lot of your newer Bible translations actually translate the name Azazel away. Mm -hmm. And the reason why they do that, in my personal opinion, is one, there's sort of a latent materialism present in a lot of modern American Protestantism, which all these translations are American, <laughs> you know. Right. Um, and having this figure of Azazel really, or Azazel really screws up your conception of the world and the spirit realm because unfortunately, a lot of modern Christians drift towards the rationalistic uh like i said materialistic philosophical understanding right. of god that people like william lane craig put forward right which is which not I find... open to us as orthodox christians because every single yeah. day if we are doing our prayers right every single day twice a day we confess that god is the maker of everything seen and unseen so god is the maker Correct. of the unseen realm and so right. if you're saying, if you're believing this rationalistic perspective that um, all there is is basically the physical world and God, then you're denying the historic creeds of the church. Right. Right. And and, and that and the, the Orthodox Church is just so bent on engaging with the spirit world, right. uh, you know, in, in such a way that having this rationalistic where demons and angels are sort of carted off to the side as sort mm -hmm. of a spiritual uh shall we say vestigial belief um it's just not acceptable to exactly. orthodox christians 
But the name Azazel is in the Hebrew uh, and Septuagint, Greek Septuagint. It's just when you tra- what they translate it as is the goat of departure, <laughs> right? And well, what they're doing is they're taking the name of Azazel and they're translating it to its literal meaning, which means he who departs, right? right? So they're like, oh, this isn't a name. This isn't a being. This is a. This is just saying the goat needs. This is what they call the goat that needs to go in the right. wilderness, the goat of departure. And I'm like, yeah, until you realize all the data we have on Azazel contradicts that. Right. One being the Akkadian, you know, Croucher demon, and two being the fact that Az- Azazel is mentioned in First Enoch in the Dead Sea Scrolls. That's right. Um, so who is Azazel? Uh, I won't get into the story too much, but I do encourage everybody who's uh, who's listening to this to go read First Enoch. Yes. But in that particular story, basically think of First Enoch as being a commentary on the first six chapters of Genesis, or particularly Genesis 6. It's the events uh, leading up to the flood and then some things shortly after that. And in this story, you learn that the sons of God, the Benecha Elohim, the, the angelic creatures who are in God's divine counsel— began teaching mankind forbidden technology. This is the second fall of angels after the original rebel, the devil, falls in the garden with the temptation of our first parents. And they teach mankind forbidden technology such as uh, cosmetics, abortion, uh, warfare is a big one. Uh, basically pagan practices uh the you know music being used as sacrifice things like that and and the text mentions these things specifically by the way right and and one of these the lists of the fallen watchers that it mentions is an angel by the name of azazel who i believe it's god who says in the in first enoch ascribe to him all sin right <laughs> in, in this instance right so he's the number one big bad who gets blamed for everything that happens. So I what's the remember, point? Is of... Azazel the one who organized? Because like they come Sam down Yaza. to Mount Hermon. Sam Yaza. Sam Yaza is the one that right. organizes the whole. Okay, he's kind sorry. of the, the number two right guy who's mentioned with Azazel. And so God orders all of them to be chained and thrown into Tartarus, right? And this is what, of course, this is, you know, they, they father the giants and then the flood happens right. and then the world gets start, you know, starts over again. But this this being of Azazel doesn't necessarily go away, despite the fact being changed in the underworld, because somehow he still exerts some some sort of influence over the world. And we see that in the post flood world, one being this ritual on the Day of Atonement where the the goat that has the lot that falls on it for a, as a cell is sent out into the wilderness as spiritual garbage. That's what I tell people. I'm like, right. And you're right. It's not a sacrifice. It's a it's not a sacrifice to the devil uh, or to a demon. It is actually taking out spiritual garbage and saying to right. Azazel, "This is your junk. Take it back. We exactly. don't want it." Right. It's very it's a very insulting ritual to a demon. It is. Yeah. <laughs> it is. And, yeah, and, and 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 it's the only one who the priest transfers sins to. Now the priest does bless a sin offering or an offering that's going to be eaten in a very similar way. An Orthodox priest will bless uh, robes that are to be worn if you're going to serve right. in the altar. Um, you know, but it's there's no transference going on, right? right. Uh, it only happens with the atoning sacrifice that's sent out into the wilderness alive. And I actually had somebody contest that. He's like, "What?" He's like, "He's like, you're telling me the animal's unclean if he if he gets the sin put out." I'm like, "Yes." <laughs> I'm like, to the to the point that the handler who takes the goat out of the right. camp cannot re-enter camp for seven days because he's unclean. Exactly. Um, and it, it, now here's something interesting. You're right. The the whole the whole uh, extra rich parts of the ritual where the goat has a scarlet thread tied onto its horns and people throw rocks and hurl insults and spit at the goat as it's led out of the camp by the handler uh, was added later. And of course, the the goat being thrown off the cliff. 
But what's interesting about this is that the whole rationale for throwing the goat off the cliff is twofold. One is likely what happened is the goat came back into the yeah, camp. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, it's like it came back and they're like, oh, no, you know, now the whole camp's unclean and they got to go take it <laughs> out again, right? So throwing it off a cliff reinsured it wouldn't come back, right? right? But the other thing is that this has parallels to what we read in First Enoch when as Azazel is pulled down into the depths of the earth and chained in Tartarus. So it seems there's a twofold reason for throwing this out. One is mm -hmm. just the practical reason, but two, symbolically, this is this is paralleling what happens to Azazel in First Enoch, which probably was in an oral tradition at the time the Torah right. was written. And so the question then is, you know, you know, how does this being filter into the rest of history? Well, I, he's not limited to Near Eastern Judaism or anything like that. I would argue, just through the research I've done for this book, that he appears in other traditions, pagan traditions, as a figure who is widely worshipped. And the one being the fact uh, the god Pan from Greek mythology, or Sylvanus, if, you're, if you want to do it with the Roman way, uh, but this is the the goat looking god. Uh, you, if you're familiar with what Mr. Tomnus looks like from Chronicles <laughs> of Narnia, uh, that's what Pan looks like, a, a satyr like figure, and he's the god of the wilderness, much like Azazel. Um, he is known for his lavish sacrifices, uh, many of which were human sacrifices. His cult was notorious for this. Uh, in fact, they would uh, offer children to Pan at Pan's Grotto in uh, Caesarea Philippi, where Jesus had the conversation with uh, with Peter and the apostles. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, and they would uh, they would offer a child by throwing it into the waterfall uh, at Pan's Grotto. And if the child sank and didn't come back up, it was considered that Pan had accepted the offering. And if it was if it fell onto a rock and crushed its skull uh, and the child bled out, it was considered that Pan rejected the sacrifice. Uh, really nasty stuff. There was also the fact that Pan's uh, worship was known to be on the level of Bacchus, you know, drunken orgies, right. lots of violence, uh, things like that. So, yeah, and it's funny they they call the thing when people would go into these frenzies, they called it pandemonium. Mm-hmm which demonia is Greek for demon, so pan-demon, <laughs> you know? Right. Uh, right. And this uh, this figure of the horned god of nature also appears in Celtic mythology. For example, mm -hmm. uh, the Cernunus. Green the green man, Cernunus, uh, who has the... He, has more, he looks more like a deer in that one, but still very same concept, a wild god of the wilderness, a god of animals. Uh, there's a similar being in Chinese mythology called, I'm probably going to butcher this, I think it's Zhan Xing, a very mysterious fig deity that looks like a goat that wears the wide-brimmed hat that you see that they wear in China, uh, who's the god of wild animals and would be petitioned to protect travelers and farmers from wild animals. And something just, you know, when doing the research for the book and seeing all these parallels of this horned you know, wilderness deity, it just made sense to me that somehow this this demon is much more prominent when it comes to dealing with demons and how price of victory over demons is understood. Uh, because the wilderness, as you mentioned earlier, was seen as a place of chaos, a place of destruction. I mean, if you look at just fairy tales, there's often stories about not going into the woods, right. you know, stay out of the woods. It's forbidden. I mean, the ancient Greeks so that anybody who lives in the wilderness is either a god or a or a monster or a beast or a god you know is the right. only thing that can live in the forest that's why uh, the desert fathers and the monks who began to live in the wilderness uh, after uh, christianity was becoming a thing the greek pagans thought they were these supernatural people right. because they're like you're living in a place where demons live and exactly. of course the the desert fathers knew this they were like, we're taking the fight to them. Right, <laughs> you know, exactly. We're, right. We're, the Desert also, Fathers were like special forces 
<laughs> yes. taking the fight to the demons behind enemy lines. Yeah, and, and it also has a, a recollection of what happens in Genesis when God's ultimate purpose for mankind was for man to turn all of the world into an Edenic garden. So going out into the desert, the place where there's no life is, and bringing life to it is right. a very right. important motif that is present in Genesis and all throughout Holy Scripture. The other thing I find interesting, especially when we're going to uh, Leviticus in, re in reference to Azazel, is that I don't know if this is purposeful, but then again, the Bible didn't have chapters for hundreds of years, right. but... Leviticus 16, you know, with the sacrifice to Yahweh and the goat sent out to Azazel, right in the next chapter, in chapter 17, there is this explicit warning that you shall not offer your children to goat idols or goat mm. demons, right? And it's like, uh-huh, right? It's like, right. To me, this is not coincidental, uh, and given the fact that there were no chapters, it seems only appropriate. It seems like God is saying, send this this spiritual trash out to Azazel, but don't sacrifice to him, right? <laughs> don't, right, you know, exactly. It, at least that makes coherent logical sense to me. And the other thing I found that is so, uh, as far as how Azazel continues to show up in, in history, is the figure of Baphomet, um, right. who is who is the god of, of witches, um, which if you Google what a, what Baphomet looks like, you've probably seen him. He looks like a the upper body of a man, the lower body of a goat, the head of a goat. And he's got like a torch in the middle of his head, and he's pointing upward to the sky with his right hand and downward with his left hand, and he has female breasts and wings. Um, right. The, the Sabbath goat, as the witches in the medieval period would have called him, but again, a god of the wilderness, a god of field and stream. It seems that this pagan influence on how, you know, wilderness gods were understood carried over into explicit diabolism, you know, right. the worship of the devil. And I, I think that that what people don't often realize is the worship of the devil is kind of a new thing. You know, Satanism, right. uh, the explicit worship of the figure that Christendom understands to be the devil is is a new thing. And I think that really ancient paganism is more <laughs> in tune into that than actually modern Satanism is. But nonetheless, right. we do see in early forms of diabolism that the pagan notion of Satan or the devil being associated with the wilderness and untamed uh, forces of nature is actually a thing in a lot of in a lot of uh, um, stuff like that which is quite scary <laughs> and plays out quite a bit right. in our book of exactly. course uh, so exactly yeah. we use it <laughs> we use that well and it's interesting so i'm glad you brought up the idea of the sa the sabbath goat and baphomet mm -hmm. um it's interesting that you know you mentioned the hand gestures and a lot of yeah. people don't know this, but his hands are actually very carefully, uh, the, the hand gesture is very intentional to give mm, Baphomet, like yeah. exactly. So it's actually a, a mockery of the hand of blessing, but it's also mm -hmm. a reverse, it's a reverse blessing. So yeah, curse, it's, yeah. exactly. So it's like a hand of curse, which, um, I actually had a funny encounter with somebody who was like, ha ha, Christian, my uh, Baphomet statue owns you because it had, it does the hand of cursing. So <laughs> I said to, so I said to him, I was like, so what you're saying is that when I go to church, my God is giving me the hand of blessing. And when you go to church, your God is giving you the hand of cursing. So your God, your own God is cursing you. And you could just see like the wheels turning on this guy's face, just like, dang it, that, that makes me <laughs> look like an idiot. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like when I, I, I've not ran into one yet, but uh, it's kind of like the guys who, they're neo-pagans who want to worship the Roman gods. I, I can't wait right. to tell them that Constantine is a god in their pantheon. So they, 
so, so they have to worship a Christian. <laughs> you know, it's like it's like, yeah, and by the way, you know, yeah, you one of your right. gods is one of my saints and you have to worship him. You know? That's right. It's like how Other how you know it's like it's not me who's got the problem, it's you, you know. But... Right, exactly. <laughs> He yeah, he got deified by their by the cult of the emperor. <laughs> yeah, the uh, yeah, I've always found that funny. It's like the most Christian emperor in all of history got turned into a god by the <laughs> pagan emperors who came after him. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> <laughs> which really shows how great of an emperor he was. Like they they knew, yeah, he, like that he was that he was a badass. They were like, yeah, like, he was he was yeah. Good. <laughs> Yeah, and he intention. You know, it's funny. I'll be I'll be uh, teaching catechism on Constantine, and and honestly, I'm just going to put a side note here. He is probably the most misunderstood person in history. Oh, for sure. And like, you know, people make so many conspiracy theories about Saint Constantine, and it's like you don't have to make any conspiracy theories about him. He is like in ancient history, probably one of the top five most written about people exactly ever. like as far as what he did we have tons of data as to what he did it's like <laughs> it's like come on but you know our 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 uh trail of blood friends just love that but you know right. it's just uh, he is one of the most yeah. misunderstood people though like literally just yeah all the time people just think all this crazy stuff and it's like no and they don't even know like the whole um oh he got baptized on his deathbed and i'm like no right. he got baptized a month before he died and that wasn't even the plan it wasn't like people yeah. think that he like waited till the very end of his life as if you could even know to do that but they think that he did that but the reality is that that's not true there was actually a whole plan to <laughs> have this big yeah. baptism ceremony and then go to right. this battle on the eastern front and mm -hmm. there, this was all planned and then he got very sick um but actually as a testament to his piety when he got sick he uh, they told him that they could postpone the baptism until he got better. And he said, no, just baptize me in bed because right. um, I don't want to delay the baptism. I want to do this. So they did mm -hmm. baptize him in bed. Um, or, I mean, back then baptism was, you know, immersion. So they had to take him out of the bed. But the point is they baptized him right there. They brought a font. They baptized him there so that he could at least be baptized and then, right. unfortunately, a month later, he passed away. So it was a very good thing that he got back. Yeah, absolutely. He did because um, he yeah. wasn't going to get better. But the point is that it was not. It there was no like plan that I'm waiting until the very end so that I can get all my sinning done. No, he was very pious. He wanted to be mm -hmm. baptized. Um, yeah. It just it took a long time because. Here's the thing, um, when you are involved in statecraft, you are forced to make decisions that are not, um, that there is no good answer. You have to make decisions that are very hard. And this right. is why um, God is supposed to be the one who appoints kings, because God is the one who knows who is supposed mm. to make these decisions and it's very difficult to be to maintain piety in that situation and that's why it took so long for constantine yeah. to be baptized is because he had to make tough decisions and some of those decisions were decisions that um there really wasn't an outcome that would have been ideal and the church recognized right. that and understood it and yeah you know it's still that way to this very day Pe people who are in political office have to make decisions that are very difficult the problem is that now we don't have kings we have elected officials and they don't necessarily have the best interest of the church or the empire in mind when they're making these decisions but 
that's yeah. a topic for a whole yeah. other discussion. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Although an, I think another... Azazel is involved in all of that, but <laughs> oh, absolutely, and, and th this also comes back to the idea that you know one of the other things I would say that a Azazel has you know influenced uh, Christianity and the perception of demons quite a bit is the fact that when you would when, when you say the word demon for a person who's really not delved into this or devil we typically imagine a being that has horns right mm -hmm. and has maybe hooves and a tail right and people laugh at that they're like oh the devil doesn't look like that or, or whatever and i'm like does he <laughs> right does he? Uh, mm -hmm. because this is how often azazel is is depicted uh That's or right. at least the, the hypostasis is of uh Azazel are depicted. I mean, Pan looks like this. Kernernas looks like this. Um, I'm not saying he, he has a physical body, but I'm saying there's a reason why he's depicted this way. Right. And and I think that that's one of those enduring things that uh, Azazel's influence has left uh, is the fact that we perceive demons as horned beings. And one of the things that I'll also bring up is is in Isaiah, satyrs are mentioned explicitly. Mm -hmm. um which what are satyrs well in, in greek mythology satyrs are uh these nature spirits that are half goat and half human um and uh, i won't get into some rather undisturbing details about their anatomy but let's just say they're they're driven by their id their most basic of right. instincts which includes sexual appetites but i mean you can google that yourself if you want to i'm not going to get right. into it here um but uh, but it's funny because Isaiah mentions whenever uh, Israel falls uh, to the hands of the heathen that the satyr will cry to his fellow and dance on the rubble of a city. And this goes back to the whole warning about not offering offerings to goat demons and things like that. But I guess the question should be now, are, why are goats associated with Azazel so much? What is this goat imagery and motif? that keeps coming up right because goats are considered clean animals in in hebrew right. uh, in the hebrew religion you know they're they're an animal you can eat they're an animal you can touch and not be unclean and and things like that and it seems so odd i mean wouldn't it be better to depict you know the devil as a pig or something right. like that and I, I think there's probably a reason for that well one is that horns are often associated with power you know, a right. symbol for power. Um, even the lamb that was slain is said to have seven horns in That's Revelation. Right. Um, there you see these these advent these uh exaltations of the Psalms that God has raised up a horn for his people. And you have Jacob telling one of his sons that he is the horn of a unicorn or shall be exalted mm -hmm. as the horn of a unicorn. Um, and so horns have a significant place to play in scripture as well as a, as a symbol of power male authority and virility and i think the other thing is that somehow goats i don't know why or or have almost a sexual connotation as well in mythology um as we mentioned the satyrs are driven by their id in greek mythology which it's funny because greek mythology is not a western culture it's the last great near mm -hmm. eastern culture so satyrs are actually come from near eastern mythology because that's where the greeks got these things from right. and somehow I, I the only thing i can think of and i haven't delved enough into this to really tell but you know how like some people will say you're a horny old goat you know right <laughs> it's like um pardon my french but but something has to do with that that may that goats are associated with male virility and male sexuality and uh typically with a an app a sexual appetite that can't be satiated so it exactly. seems that that's one of the reasons and when you think about uh, azazel and his cult which often had orgies and things like that uh, and idolatry itself being associated with sexual immorality i mean god even calls the nation of israel a whore that whores after other gods right. right um it's it's these two sins are often associated and this is also again we're going to go back to the leviticus 17 and 18 it's like 16 right. 17 18 god mentions the three sins that'll vomit you out of the land one of them is idolatry 
one of them is drinking blood and the other one is sexual immorality and all those things are associated with paganism with rituals and and lifestyles that are associated with the worship of heathen gods and of course that's not coincidental at all and and somehow you know pan sort of embodies this basic animalistic nature that mm -hmm. comes out when people worship him i mean even the greeks uh to an extent even though they honored pan as being this this one of the gods in their pantheon he was seen to be a baser god or a lesser god he was a god you didn't want to emulate hence why not there wasn't a huge following of him compared to say the cult of zeus or something right. like that even they seen that there was something repulsive about worshiping pan um this animalistic creature and i think this is also harkens back to when the psalmist says that you know the that those who worship them idols become like them you know become animalistic mm -hmm. become demonized and things like that that's another one we're going to do is one on demonosis because <laughs> that's a part in the book that's too right. uh, exactly yeah and the other thing about the enduring image of azazel throughout history that i think has recently come back into the memory of people here in america is the figure known as krampus yes, <laughs> around christmas krampus. time yeah, there's there's actually a whole tradition. See, uh, it, now in Germany and Austria, in places like that, Krampus is still a very important figure around Christmas time. I mean, you just thought Halloween was scary. I mean, go spend Christmas right. in Austri Austria and, and <laughs> Germany, right? Uh, for those of you who don't know, on December the 5th, uh, December the 5th is Krampusnacht in, in Austria in, and Germany, or Krampus night. And this is the day before St. Nicholas Feast Day on the Western calendar, December the 6th. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is these German guys get into suits that look like satyrs, right? These goat demon looking things. And they carry a bag of switches and and they go around and they hit kids with it. <laughs> and and, and they, they punish the bad kids for the things that they do. And mm -hmm. this seemed to be a night of, of of fright and revelry and things like that. But then the next day, on St. Nicholas Day, he shows up and chains the Krampuses right. and drags them around with him. And people say, what does that have to do with Christianity and Christmas? Well, actually, it has a lot to do with it. And exactly. the idea here, if we remember in the garden, when when the serpent falls... You have God telling the serpent he's going to grow on his belly and eat the dust of the ground forever. And this is where I'm like, okay, this is where you literalists need to back off. Everybody right. knows snakes don't eat dirt. Ancient people knew snakes didn't eat dirt. <laughs> um, right. And everybody knew snakes didn't have legs. There's no nothing in Genesis that says the snake had legs. That's a conjecture made up by literalists again. And uh, so the idea here is that Adam and Eve are made of dust, right? And so the idea is that the devil wanted to be a god. He wanted to overthrow Yahweh Most High, Yahweh Sabaoth. And it's the ironic thing here is God says, oh, you want to be a god? I'll make you a god. You're going to be the god of death. You know. Right. Um, and what people don't realize here is that in the myths, the god of death is the most miserable god of all. I mean, he rules over dead people who can do right. nothing for him. I mean, if you, especially if you read the myth of Hades, you know, how Hades became the god of the underworld. He was cheated into right. it by Zeus and, and Poseidon. And he was probably, of all the Greek gods, the most reasonable one of all. He literally just leaves people alone right. and rules over the underworld. And so, yeah, so, so the idea here is that the only thing Satan has authority over and in any sort of godlike way is when mankind dies, he consumes them. Right, he brings them into the realm of death, never to live again. Hence, why this image of the hell mouth becomes so prominent in not only the Old Testament but in early Christian art as well. Mm -hmm. uh, the earth swallowing up the dead and the, it being depicted as a monster with a big mouth that eats people. Right. Well, and this, by the way, you this, mentioned modern Judaism. That's actually yeah. also why, and this is going to make some people uncomfortable, but. This is why in modern Judaism, Satan is mm -hmm. actually seen as a morally ambiguous figure. He's not yeah. seen as, um, right. 
evil per se because modern Jews actually believe that Satan works for God. He's on God's payroll. He mm -hmm. is just the one who happens to have been put in charge of death by God. Right. Um now the he's Satan. still seen yeah. as he's still seen as a problem for us because you know he likes his job he he wants you to be in the place of death so he's not right. he's not about the business of making you a saint but they still see him as being under god's authority whereas right. we see him as being at war with god and we see christ as having defeated and destroyed him and destroyed yep. him of his kingdom and that's what's going on in revelation 12 where St. Mm -hmm. Michael casts Satan out of heaven. Why is St. Mm -hmm. Michael in heaven? Well, St. Michael is in heaven because at that point in time, he had a job. Um, he was still allowed to participate in the divine council. We see that in the book of mm -hmm. Job. Even though it's obvious that he's in rebellion and he's a problem, he's still allowed to be there. We see that in the book of right. Job. And he's causing problems. He's kind right. of, and in um, in Second Temple Jewish literature, we see this a lot, where basically Satan is constantly trying to accuse mankind and get them to sin, and then bring accusation against them. And Saint Michael is right. constantly trying to get people to do right, and then he's constantly like throwing shade at Satan. And they're always butting heads. And this particularly mm -hmm. happens at the graveside of, of St. Moses. St. Moses is Continuing dead. Over the body, yeah. Exactly. St. Moses is dead and Satan shows up to claim him. And St. Michael shows up and says, what are you doing? Uh, this one doesn't belong to you. And Satan says, yes, he does. He smote the rock. And Michael is like, oh, screw you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> You can't yeah. have it. People don't realize when he says, the Lord rebuke thee, they think it's some sort of lofty, the Lord rebuke thee. And it's right. like, no, it's literally like, screw you. Yeah, it's exactly. like, you know, <laughs> he's like, oh, yeah. piss off. Man. Just... Right, right. That is the, right. That's the attitude or the air that that's supposed to give off there. Yeah, piss <laughs> off, right? And, and so in the similar way, Krampus is also you know seeing that on this night before saint nicholas it, the 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 krampus demon and nicholas are sort of portrayed in right. this way that the devil the minions of the devil the krampus which i argue is one of pan's hypostasis um comes out of the wilderness out of the woods and is there to claim the human beings that have sinned and done wrong and uh, broken fealty with God, but then you know, as is their right, as as you know, deities or beings who have charge over death and have charge over sinners mm -hmm. once they have uh, rebelled against God. But then the next day, you have Saint Nicholas who comes in, who represents Christ, of course. And I, I will add this: uh, Saint Nicholas was from modern day Turkey right mm -hmm. which was a greek state during his time yep. period so he would have been very familiar with satyrs um and he chains these beings and he drags them off back to where they came from conquering them and and it as a uh, a type of christ figure right um which this is very much part of the great commission when christ commissions yes. the apostles um, it's this is not a lot of people like to portray the Great Commission as a uh, as a nice little thing. Oh, share your faith. Right. Not really. Um, this is a, a battle call. You know, he, he's instead of of which Christ has won the decisive battle, which has conquered Satan and the demons. But there, the war is not over yet. And rather than do that himself, he commissions us as the future members of his divine council to go out and battle the demons on his that's behalf. Right. And so we see a portrayal of this that gets uh, ritualized and made into a very interesting tradition in places like Germany and Austria, which recall the Great Commission, which recall Satan's fall and chaining and being put back into the abyss. And I think it's really amazing how that's become. I, I wish 
I wish, I hope if, if orthodoxy, you know, becomes a thing in Germany where it becomes, you know, more prominent that, that the uh, Orthodox Church will adopt that tradition because I yes. think it's so powerful. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, it's fun. I mean, the horror around Christmas, Great. why not? Exactly. Um, and, and so, yeah, I, I really, so just a wink, yes, Krampus will show up in our books eventually. I won't give away any more, but uh, <laughs> But yeah, I think it's it's so interesting how that happened. And another hypostasis, like like how did Germans get a hold of satyrs when they're Near Eastern and Greek, right. you know, myths, right. you know, and Nicholas and all that. Um, I mean, first of all, the church is universal, so it doesn't matter if the saint's Greek or African or whatever. That's right. But there is a horned god in German mythology too, and mm -hmm. uh, most people wouldn't think of this guy, but uh, Odin. That's right, Odin. And right in the Paleolithic period, as well as the early Bronze Age in Germany and uh, Austria, you see early depictions of Woden or Wotan. Um, he looks very much like a satyr. He doesn't right. necessarily look like the one-eyed old warrior god with a horned helmet and a spear. I mean, he still has a spear, but he looks a lot like a satyr. Yeah, and. And, and archaeological depictions of him, he still has. Like, he has a horned helmet. It's just that it's yep. his helmet, but it has like deer horns coming out of it. Correct. And so you know, he has. Uh, so I I often found it interesting just from an archaeological and historic perspective because Odin was not the head of the Nordic pantheon originally. Right. It was the god Tyr, right? Which uh, Tyr, if you don't know who Tyr is, uh, Tyr was an, an older god of war that uh, he's depicted as a man usually dressed in armor, carrying a sword, but he's missing his right hand. So his sword hand is completely removed. So he's a left-handed god. Uh, and that comes from the fact that in the myth, he, uh, when the gods were trying to chain Fenris, who's the, uh, the son of Loki, the giant wolf, um, he... They make it into the form of a game <laughs> for right. Fenris, and they they say they have this competition. And it's like I bet we can chain you, Fenris, and Fenris is like yeah, go ahead, I can break anything. And of course, they try it a thousand times until finally they make a chain out of supernatural elements. So the breath of a fish, the sound of a cat's paw. <laughs> you see, and those are things. Those are things that don't exist, right? right. Which is why they're so. Cool. And um. Fenris is like, I think you're trying to trick me. I think you finally found a way to chain me. And, and Tyr, Tyr is depicted as a very noble god. He says, all right. He sticks his hand in Fenris's mouth. He's like, if I'm trying to deceive you, then you could bite off my sword hand, which is, you know, the right arm for, for a warrior was his sword hand. And so that would have been his place of power. And so they chain Fenris. And of course, he can't get out. And as a result, he bites off Tyr's hand. But Tyr's uh, name, if you translate it into Greek, so in Anglo-Saxon, Tyr is called Tyr, which is where we get Tuesday, mm -hmm. right? And if you translate translate uh, Tyr's name into Greek, it's Zeus. Mm. Yeah, and and if you translate it into Latin, it's Y, which is Jupiter, which means Father Zeus, right? <laughs> And right. on a side on a side note, when you translate that into Hebrew, you know what it is? What? Yafet. Oh, interesting. The son of Noah, yeah, who is the father of all Greeks, which that's a side note. We'll go into that later. But uh, but it, it's interesting. The early Nords worshipped uh, Tyr, which makes sense of all other Indo-European religions when you consider right. the names. But then all of a sudden Zeus or Odin just comes out of nowhere. Right. Just like it's like and just topples Tyr as head of the Pantheon. And it's like, what is going on? And it seems like somehow uh, the Nords came to honor this hypostasis of, of, of Azazel or Pan or whoever you want to call him as the head of the Pantheon, uh, right. even though Thor continues to be the more popular of the, of all the gods, but it's, he's such a mysterious figure that, that ends up there. But uh Yeah. Does Azazel is a creature whose whose fingerprint is or is on a lot of right. pagan traditions and things like that, and always a, a vile, nasty god. Even Odin, exactly. one of his uh, epithets, is uh, the most evil one. And right. <laughs> honestly, he he's more evil than than Loki would ever dream of being. 
<laughs> right. Loki is just a trickster. Odin is actually. Yeah, he's playing a prank. Odin wants to mess you up. <laughs> you exactly. Know? His name means exactly. insane. His name literally means insane right. in, in Old Norse. So, uh, and by the way, I know that people are going to. Um, People are going to think this is weird because Odin has become associated in our in our sort of popular culture with like this wise old man figure. Um, and so a lot of neo-pagans think that's what Odin was like. But we're not talking about Marvel Comics Odin here. We're talking right. about the actual like the actual mythology. Um, so that's one thing. And I would also point out that if you're surprised by the idea that these gods used to have, you know, more animalistic features, that's mm -hmm. actually how all ancient paganism begins. Even Zeus. So exactly. Yeah. Even Zeus. Zeus starts out, he has the head of a bull and Hera mm -hmm. has the head of a cow, which is why. Cow-eyed Hera. Yep. Which is why Homer calls her cow-eyed Hera, because that was actually originally the way she was depicted, but over and time, Athena with the owl. Yeah. Yep, Athena was an owl, which is why she's called Wise Athena. Um, Thor is a goat. He has the goat yep, chariot. You know, exactly. The Christmas goat that the Swedes put out. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So all of these things, that's how they begin. And then if you're asking, well, why, why have I never seen that? Well, I would say two things. One is you have. Um, every time you've seen anything about, you know, ancient Egypt or pyramids or anything, the only difference between the ancient Egyptians and all of the other kinds of pagans is that the ancient Egyptians just never really developed out of that. Um, yeah, the a, head like Horus having a bird's head. And, exactly. Yeah, but there's actually a having a lion's head. Yeah, exactly. There's actually a reason for that, though. And it's kind of weird. Um, but all pagan the way paganism always starts is and i'm using paganism as a broad term here but basically broad non-christian non-jewish religion right. yeah or non-islamic um, religion so yeah. the way that archaeologists have uncovered that this always begins is it always begins with these reliefs with these animal-headed gods and then over time they get sort of humanized and Right. Actually, it's like uh, it's almost like what happens is and I think that this makes sense from a Christian perspective because we believe that these entities are demons. So when they first appear mm -hmm. to people, they appear in a form that is perhaps more honest, more true and more frightening. Mm -hmm. And they frighten people into worshiping them. And then yep. as the people become more comfortable with them they put on a deceptive air so that they can kind of deceive them and keep them because fear will only hold you for so long. I mean, uh, study any like historical, you know, um, dictatorship, study Stalin or anything. Fear only held people so long. Eventually you need things like propaganda to come in and actually start portraying the person that we fear as the good guy otherwise eventually we get to a point where it's like i'm not doing what he wants anymore i don't care how scary he is i'm done i'd and, rather just die you know right exactly i'd rather you just kill me than keep dealing with your gulags um so eventually right. you have to start and that that happens with stalin too he starts out as this terrifying figure who everybody's afraid of but over time he becomes the man of steel who we're all supposed to rally around. Why does that happen? It's because Stalin was smart enough to know that he couldn't control people by fear forever. He had to yeah. change his image to some degree. And right. Odin is the same way. Odin couldn't control people by fear forever. He had to eventually change his tactic. And mm -hmm. the only difference is that with demons they can take hundreds of years to change their form and then why right. it didn't change in egypt it actually didn't change in egypt because to be honest or Egyptians, india or india the reason Today, it doesn't the change, last pagan religion alive that's right india. yeah exactly Truly pagan religion yeah. exactly and the reason why it doesn't change in those places is because um well 
in both instances, their religion is actually a kind of bizarre monotheism. Um, and yeah. all of the different gods are just manifestations of one kind of entity. Um, now, India yeah. takes that a step further and thinks that we're all actually manifestations of the entity and everything is just an illusion and everything yes. is God and God is everything. I don't know for sure if Egypt went that far, but Egypt did believe Not too much. that yeah. there was Egypt did believe that there was only one true God mm. and that he manifested himself as all of the gods and that it was all just sort yeah. of play acting. And we know that because right. if you were initiated into the cult of the priests, so not like the normal people in Egypt believed that there were all these gods and stuff. But if you became an initiate and were actually initiated into the temple cult, you would be taught that there was one God who was play acting and that it yeah. was this whole but, thing. Yeah, you see so, that historically with Akhenaten. That's right. right. Remember the, exactly. the, the heretic of Egypt who tried to destroy all the little cults within Egypt and made everybody worship the sun god, which That's right. there's a reason why, why, why he did this. One is that the cult you mentioned where you were initiated as a priest, which the pharaoh was a high priest, you know, had the secret knowledge, the gnosis to know there really is only one god and he's play acting as these other characters. But also the fact that the pharaoh was seen as a hypostasis of the sun god. Right. So this would consolidate all worship to the pharaoh as exactly. the one true god. But yeah, the, the animalistic... Uh, and the other thing I would say that there's also a practical level for depicting the, or the early depictions of gods as animal totems, which you also see in Native American religion right. still today, um, is that it's very hard to depict a spirit. Right. something that's bodiless and has no form so you have to you have to depict it as something that is closest to something you're familiar with right so like if the god is ravenous and always hungry and always out to kill you might depict the god as a wolf right because that communicates you know see people weren't stupid they didn't think oh they actually look like this right. they may have shown up like that but that's not really the point it's kind of you see this even in our tradition, like the cherubim have four faces, and one looks like a lion, and one looks like a man, the other one a, an eagle right. and an ox. But it's and they could look like that. But the fact of the matter is, is that it's trying to tell you what they do, right? right. Like having faces that face all four directions tell you that they see all. There's nothing that escapes their gaze. They have eyes all over them. That means they see everything, and. The fact is the ox is a servant animal, so it tells you this being is a servant. It serves something. Right. The eagle is a is considered an animal that's fast. You know, putting the wings on something right. told you it was fast, so it can move really fast. The lion, of course, is ferocious, so it's a dangerous thing. And then, of course, and the human a ruler and a ruler. And then the uh, the human face tells you it's got human intelligence. You right. know, it 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 can, it can think and reason, and so. It's a very complicated thing, you know, but yeah, the, the fact is you're right. Fear only goes so far. And as people become more accustomed to the gods, the gods start forming themselves to the image of the human. And that's why you see Zeus depicted as a 18 year old jacked man right. with an old man's head. Right. And, <laughs> and, and so, you know, and then you have a, and then, but but still, you know, you see him manifest as a swan. You see him That's manifest right. as a bull um, and a snake. And you see that happen with with uh, Athena, you know, manifesting That's as right. an owl and uh, Horus as an eagle headed man. You know, it just never really goes away. You know, exactly. over time. But and Pan, I Pan Azazel, I think, are no different in this regard. So exactly. And and interestingly enough, you see this in reverse with Christ who's understood to be a man first and foremost you know and god but right. then you see the symbolism of him as the lamb that was slain and you know and all that kind of stuff which i'm like oh that's kind of cool it's it's the the pagan one is the inverse of that it starts with the animal and then becomes more manlike and then that's right yeah and then so, christ the... starts with with the humanity but then he manifests in these ways 
again for the same kind of reason that you just mentioned it's like he shows mm -hmm. us what's familiar he brings a, us into himself by showing us in what's familiar so that we can understand right. him in this way and yeah yep. and it's beautiful that he does that too like unlike mm -hmm. pan who showed or or azazel who shows up as a goat and then eventually sort of pretends to be a wise old man jesus shows up as a wise man and then says okay let me help you understand me think about mm -hmm. a lamb think about this it's like it's so um it's so beautiful how jesus is the complete inverse of the demons which is why right. he gives us theosis as opposed to demonosis bingo that's probably gonna be maybe our topic next time is demonosis yes <laughs> uh, now that we're on the track of villains i think i think we maybe maybe we need to do that one for our next uh podcast next month for concerning the book so uh yeah that's fun. right that's right yeah all well, right. bro, it's uh, it's been a blast as usual. Um, Absolutely, uh, I can't wait to do this again. So, but uh, now I have to go off and see the Godzilla movie. So, oh, all right, <laughs> yes. Oh, dude, you're gonna yeah. love it. You are gonna love it. So, I, I hope so. You know. I hope so. It looks like great fun. All right, brother. Well, thanks everybody for listening to us yak for the last hour, and hopefully <laughs> you'll buy the book, and hopefully this will pique your interest even more than the last one. So. That's right. God bless everybody. Be sure to share this with your friends so that they too can be freed indeed. God bless.